May I tell you something? When I took my daughter, um, she was looking for colleges, and she and she made me wear a ball cap and glasses when she went for the weekend <laughs> at Columbia. And it was, I remember uh, walking on the campus, and I had the ball cap down, and I was looking down, because she really didn't want anybody to know who I was. And... Uh, uh, so I'm looking down, and all I see are these people on the street, and their feet are, they've painted their shoes green, and they're wearing green, and then I see a little tip of orange right here, about this. And I said, where the hell am I? And she said, Dad, you are in the middle of a carrot farmer protest right now. And I said to her, I cannot spend my money here. <laughs> and, um, but the guy given the tour of the campus said to me, and you know, we want you to know that we, we have a wide, this is a very diverse campus. We have speakers from the entire spectrum. We had Ahmadinejad here and Bill and Hillary Clinton. <laughs> I think there's more of the spectrum over here. Uh, but it's, it's amazing how they just don't even see the... The, well, the keynote speaker at NYU for this semester declared that Bill Clinton was one of the two most conservative presidents over the past 100 years, so that's the... Uh, what? <laughs> that was the statement, yeah. and that's what we're dealing with, and it's just incredible that they can perpetuate these things that are just historically inaccurate, no, if not challenge downright them. stupid. That's, that's why, I tell you what, I think the, the professor I told you about earlier, I gained his respect when he told me not to read a book. I questioned him on something, and I said, well, what do you think about this theory? And he said, who are you reading? And I told him, and he said, don't read him. Read this guy. That guy, is, he's wrong. Read this guy. And so I wrote it down. The next week I came to class, and I raised my hand, and I said, well, let me ask you this. And he said, Mr. Beck, didn't I tell you last week to stop reading that guy? And I said, yes, you told me to read the other guy, which I did. But let me get back to him. And he looked at me and he said, excuse me? And I said, I, I, don't, I don't care that you disagree with him. I want to know why you disagree with him. Why is he wrong? And that was the beginning of a relationship. I mean, you know, it's not like we were hanging out and having beers together. <laughs> but th I think that was a point where he looked at me and he said, oh, this guy wants to actually learn. And there are professors that I think if you, that's what they're paid for. You know, I don't know what they think they're being paid for, uh, but challenge them, push them up against the wall, question them with boldness, make them defend it. Because that's what you're, that's what you're trying. You are the person that is buying his service. Make him do his job. Make her earn her money. It's the last, and maybe the last chance you'll ever have of anybody having to earn their money in this society ever again. <laughs> um, we'll be right back in just a second. Welcome back to our special, uh, our series, Time to Be Heard. It's time for young conservatives to be heard. This um, is a chalkboard that I did on, uh, on Tuesday's show. And it is, it's a story, really, of Barack Obama. Uh, uh, everybody in his life, I mean, this, these are the highlights that we could sp uh, squeeze into an hour. The communists and the uh, Marxists in his life, mom and dad, uh, Marxist, communist, Marxist, I think a Marxist, communist, anti-capitalist at best, workers of the world unite, Marxist, Marxist. I asked this question because when I finished the show, I walked off and I said, I don't think I know one Marxist. I don't, I don't know one Marxist. Is there anybody here that knows this many Marxists? And you're on, you're on a college campus and you don't know that many Marxists. Here's the, here's the problem. Do you, do you recognize the difference between people who openly, at least said at one time, I'm a communist. I'm a communist revolutionary. But now he says, in his own words, I'm going to drop the radical pose for the radical ends. Who's being taught um, social justice in school? Katie, you being taught social justice? 
I mean, I, I was taught social. I went to the College of the Holy Cross in Massachusetts. I graduated, but I mean, I have to say that my political science department at school was very fair and balanced, and I actually had an ex I would say an excellent education there. Now, but so, hang on, so social social justice as Marxism as social, liberation theology so, or social justice as um, I think you see in a lot of you know the Jesuit institutions. It's very mm -hmm. and sort of the whole Catholic left. But what? But I, what do they mean? I think Take it or give it? Take it and then give it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, that's social, that's Marxist social justice, yeah. And uh, Leah, we were talking, you yeah. had a two? Two teachers in the last three weeks who used the analogy of it's easier for a camel to enter the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter heaven. You know, we have... Did, how did you debate that? What did you say? You know, I, I was too stunned to say anything, and I'm like, is it really worth it to argue about this? Yes, it is. And, <laughs> of course, it yes, is. Yes, it is. Uh, but the real problem here is that when you're using analogies like that, not only are they pushing an agenda, but they're purposely perversing yes. a religion for politics. And that truly, well, see, truly that, that's disgusts the, me. That's the secret here, and that's when... You know, we've been doing this uh, year, uh, Faith, Hope, and Charity, and one of the reasons why I'm on faith is because it's being perverted from the inside. It's being used. And that's where liberation theology came from. It came from South America. They knew they couldn't, they knew they couldn't control the people unless they could break the back of religion. Catholicism was so strong, so they weaseled their way in there and distorted things. Kevin, you were having a conversation about um, uh, not yes, it was the sort of the perversion of the of charity. Yeah. As you know, we were talking about a, a time we were debating against the College of Democrats. We were talking about uh, sort of different alternatives to tax regime, and this individual had offered the idea that well, no one would give to charity if we didn't have, you know, an income tax, so there'd be the tax deduction. But, but our response was. You know, we don't give to charity because of a tax deduction. We give to charity out of compassion, wanting to help others. What, what is the problem with that? What's the problem with that theory? If, if you say, well, nobody will do it because there isn't a tax deduction, so we're going to take it from people because it needs to be done. Kristen, what's the problem with that? To me, it makes, it makes people sound like they're greedy and they're only doing it because, oh, well, it's a tax deduction. I, I get more money on my tax paycheck. And it's not fair because some of us do donate money out of the goodness of our hearts or towards charities and memories of lost one, and it makes people out to be evil. Okay, what, uh, Jason. Well, Americans have been proven to be the most charitable people on earth, even with the amount of usurping taxes that we've been uh -huh. given, especially in, across the Northeast and different states. But you guys are missing the point. What does that collapse? What does that hurt by taking it, by, by, by doing it this way? Go ahead. What I was going to say is the incremental impact of that is that if they can take this much for you that they think should be given the charity, how much more will they take and what's, what's it justified towards? Michael, what were you just saying? Who do I trust more, the federal government or the charity I want to give the money to? See, to I, do think the right you, thing? I think you guys are all, uh, they're all good answers, but I think you're missing the main point. What is the point, if we're going to go back to the eye of the needle, what was the point of that? The point of that was that, you know, you can't enter heaven by doing stuff. It's about having it come from your heart. It's not, you're building resentment so what happens when people are giving that with, way through the government as this, opposed to giving freely. Conservatism is compassionate. Liberalism is forcing people to regulate morality, and you cannot do that. If a system takes it from it, first of all, if... If that's the definition of charity, I'm one of the most charitable men on the planet every <laughs> April 15th. Um, that's not the definition of charity. And what it does is it corrupts us as individuals because, I mean, the difference between any small town that I've ever lived in and New York City, and I find myself doing this, I walk by things and problems in New York City and I think, why hasn't the city fixed this? Because they're taxing me through the nose. Why haven't they fixed this? Instead of saying, why don't I pick this up? Why can't I do this? I've got to fix this. There's a problem here. You walk by homeless and homeless and homeless and you think, how much am I paying? How many beds are there? How much? Why isn't this fixed yet? Instead of saying, brother, are you okay? It stops us and gives our responsibility to somebody else. That's... That's not the way to uh, build a better man or a better human. We'll be back in just a second.